The future is watching. Welcome to Opcode Virtual Summit. Hello, hello, hello. Um, well, I hope everything is working fine. If there is uh, any issue as usual, uh, just let me know. Uh, this time, uh, I didn't send the, uh, the mailing list, uh, to everyone. So I guess if you have, uh, if you're on the stream now, it means that uh, either you're a speaker <laughs> or you're watching the tweet or you actually subscribe to, uh, the channel. Um, and actually, uh, even if you check on the website now, uh, I move the, uh, oh. That's kind of crap. Uh, I was about to say, like, I moved the uh, the YouTube uh, view, uh, which apparently, like, the Twitch one only works from time to time. Uh, but if you rather if you rather be on YouTube rather than Twitch, uh, the link is available on the uh, actual uh, uh, Twitter account. Uh, I'm wondering if the uh, view is not working yeah actually i think maybe it's because uh, in incognito mode it does not show it actually because it does work on my uh, regular session it's uh it, it's good to know so i hope you're all uh, doing well for this uh, ninth edition as uh sima just reminded us uh, in the chat uh actually i can probably even show it here it was hidden uh yeah so this is the ninth edition uh out of a series of 10 so in two weeks uh it's gonna be the uh last edition i think at least for that season you know then i will take a break uh maybe i will do something like a bit more uh casual instead of just like a, a once every two weeks type of thing um so so far after like nine episodes on youtube i think we have like around like uh 800 ish uh, subscribers uh i guess it's an average of like uh, you know like 100 uh per uh, episode uh, but i don't think i don't know if we're gonna get to the 1000 uh by the uh, 10th episode i guess we'll see uh and on twitch it's uh yeah, it's, it's it's even more difficult to get uh, uh followers but uh i think like people are more used to like uh, more regular content so i guess that's my feedback you know as uh <laughs> from the actual uh oh it works fine on your incognito view okay okay interesting ah, i guess it, I, I guess it's a bit random then uh because it's, it's filed uh i failed to load on my thing uh but the great thing is like you can have the chat on the side and stuff although like the uh youtube uh, one is probably more convenient because uh and unlike gamers i guess everyone has a youtube account uh but uh, yeah, but it's pretty. It's quite difficult to get like uh, subscribers uh, on YouTube and Twitch compared to Twitter. Uh, although on Twitter now, I guess it's also becoming like uh, more difficult than before because there's so many people, and uh, I think there's also like less viewers now because like confinement is being lifted in a bunch of places. Uh, for instance, us in Dubai now, uh, like the confinement is like. Uh, very very limited uh, we just have to wear a mask uh, when we go outside uh, i think something in france i don't think there's like a really enforced like, confinement unless you're traveling or coming inside the country um but yeah so uh, thanks uh for for joining us for this uh ninth episode uh i think uh jaziel you're one of the uh like strong, uh, strong supporter. I think you've been here from uh, <laughs> if, if, if probably like the first or like the second episode, and you've been attending all of them. Uh, <laughs> thanks for for the support. It's 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 quite uh, it's quite nice. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's always always good to see. Uh, I do think like the format though. I, I do I do like the format. Uh, I we I would I mean. I would say I wish like more people would like benefit from it, you know, because I don't know, like uh, in terms of yours, it's not doing that much. I would say like re regular like webinars and I don't know, like ransomwares would like probably do like more views, maybe because it's more accessible, you know. Uh, so I'm wondering if like the content is like too niche or not, you know. But at the same time, uh, I would say that what that's what brings like a quality audience, which is quite good, uh, especially like nowadays. I would say. Um, and 
the the flexibility i think is kind of cool like uh, so i was talking with uh, Mohammed uh, was going to speak after on uh, malware http uh, communication channels and for instance like he said he, he prepared slides he has a white paper that he's going to publish after so we're going to put it on the github so that's quite cool and patrick is going to come with like his blog post and read the blog post uh, which is also what i did uh, last time when i made my uh, github repository public for uh, uh, my arm uh, 64 like uh, exploit so i think it's it's kind of cool to have like a, a more like flexible format because i don't know if uh, any of you remember but every time we had to submit something to a frac or people wanted to submit to a frac you never knew when was going to be the next edition and then at some point like uh which is not a bad thing you know they kind of were a bit more like uh, picky on the type of writing and uh you know they wanted it to be like uh, a bit uh, cleaner uh which like knowing the backstory you know it definitely makes, uh, makes sense because <laughs> of all the the stuff they had um but yeah i think it's, I, I still uh, uh, like the the format of like okay if you have something cool you can present it you know whatever format you like um uh, let, let me know what you you think about the format um and uh what uh, could also be done for the uh last uh well, Opcode Live, which should be on July 29, uh, so in two weeks. Uh, I think we're probably going to have like one or two uh, roundtable, uh, maybe like w at least one talk. And if there is more stuff like coming up, you know, like uh, we'll probably just like uh, add it to that one, I guess. Uh, but yeah, if there is like anyone you would like to see or stuff you would like to uh, have presented, uh yeah definitely uh let me know uh for that uh, uh last episode for which is like in two weeks i guess it's gonna arrive soon because if you think about it the first uh upcut i think was yeah, like 25th of march already so i guess it has been like uh four months already so it does go back like very quickly um and yeah, and since life is going back to normal now, so I don't know if uh, if it's still worth like continuing the thing or not. Uh, definitely let me know uh, anywhere. Like uh, as I was saying, uh, we're always on the uh, Discord channel, so definitely more than happy to hear uh, more, more feedback uh, around it. Um, but yeah, so without uh, further ado, because uh, I think I've said all the stuff I wanted to uh, say for that time uh definitely uh come subscribe if you didn't yet you know uh so i cannot subscribe say like 8 30 so all the presentations are still here in case you missed uh, any of the previous editions so as usual you know we take the live stream and then we cut it to some uh, some cleaning uh put all the content here uh, <laughs> definitely in four months, uh, definitely per, uh, got more content than in three years of opcode, I would say. Uh, because, yeah, I guess that's like 10 editions, like between three and four uh, talks every time. So that's between 30 and 40 uh, talks. Uh, I guess that's the equivalent of like two free conference um so that's that's pretty uh that, that's pretty good uh definitely thanks to uh, everyone who uh, has been speaking and even uh, we have had uh, some returning speakers so costin was uh, the the main uh, returning speakers uh at some point but for like this episode it's kind of cool we have two uh, returning speakers so we have uh, mohammed and patrick um so yeah that that means a lot because it also means like speakers also having a good experience they enjoy the format and uh a person also as like a speaker i do think it's much better because you don't have to wait uh for instance like what i was presenting last week uh there's some research i did uh two weeks prior to it uh, then as soon as i was done i just presented it and that's it you know with my blog post otherwise you would have to wait like a few months to be accepted in a conference so I do feel like it's definitely more efficient as a medium um, to share the uh, data or information. And uh, we're probably gonna see more of it. So, but the main people who have seen, we are doing some pretty good streams where all the bug bounty people, uh, super active on Discord, uh, super active on Twitch. And 
people are like um they are really uh really active uh so i don't know if this is because it's less niche uh than that also i'm definitely sure they're making a much better uh job at uh, at promoting because uh, it was not uh, really uh the, the priority like also the idea is to also grow organically you know uh, without pushing too much and uh, uh getting uh, like additional uh, viewers to see uh, organically it could be done uh but yeah they've done it like pretty well uh other than that all the people doing like virtual conferences uh so far i mean I, I, like uh, i'm sure you would all agree like over the past four months we did i've seen a lot of those uh, virtual events it was a bit too much uh i mean it is still too much you know like there's something like uh, almost every day uh and a lot of stuff is not really uh, uh I, I would say not really relevant um and whenever there's like some cool stuff is like really uh, really late um but yeah so yeah so without uh further ado uh i will uh, get uh let uh, mohammed uh, get ready so you can you can share your screen and everything and uh yeah so we can uh, hear uh i didn't check the slide although i received them uh, in advance i just wanted to get uh, <laughs> the, the the surprise uh for it so i can ask the questions uh, at the same time I'm, uh, as i am uh, w watching the uh pre presentation uh but yeah so can i is going to be talking about some new uh, malware. I've, I don't know if this is one malware or collection of malware using similar like communication techniques. Uh, but yeah, that should be uh, quite cool. So I'm just going to launch the transition and then uh, we can go. Okay. The future is watching. Welcome to Opcode Virtual Summit. All right. <clears throat> Hi, all. Uh, can you hear me, uh, Matt? Yeah, awesome. So, okay, my name is Mohamed Mubel. I'm a second time presenter at Opcode. It was too good for some not to uh, do it another time with another research. Uh, today, yeah, no, I won't. <laughs> but that's okay. It, it, it is too tempting to do it, but last minute uh, decision not to do it. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's fine. That's fine. No worries. So, today I'll be talking about a journey into malware HTTP communication channels spectacular. It's a journey, meaning that it's based on my own experience, like at least for the last 10 years, in reverse engineering different malware communication channels, client and server wise. And in particular here, the focus is on HTTP, not HTTPS or any other custom protocol, be it ASCII or uh, uh, binary. So it's going to be interesting. And I'm pretty sure that you will see stuff that before, at least this is my expectation. You might have seen like blogs here and there talking about some of the stuff, but definitely not to the depth that I'll be going into. And uh, those, the, this, this particular research. And to mention it, like right at the beginning, there will be a full technical pa paper talking about everything that I'm, I'll be talking about in this presentation. So you don't have to worry about taking notes or uh, scratching your heads or whatnot. The technical paper goes into full details into every uh, case that I'll be addressing in this talk. So um, a bit about me. Uh, I'm a senior security researcher at Trend Micro. I'm a member of the Digital Vaccine Lab. If you haven't heard of us, we do, uh, I mean, it's part of Tipping Point. And uh, we, we work on uh, IDS slash IPS solution. We write filters, uh, reverse engineering malware and vulnerabilities. And uh, my interests lie in the area of reverse engineering and malware research, intrusion detection and prevention systems. And I have a special interest in C++ language, and in particular, the compiler and uh, software development and uh, performance analysis. And as you can tell from the talk, I'm also interested in exotic communication protocols, not only specific to uh, malware, but 
communication protocols in general. So I have a bit of uh, a critical mind uh, set when it comes to uh, reversing protocols or even just reading the specifications. So I like to dabble into this area as well. Uh, introduction. So as I mentioned at the beginning, oh, yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay, for, for the introduction, uh, as I mentioned, the talk will be about malware uh, communication protocol. And uh, I know you must have reverse engineer malware CNC communication channel, or if you read a blog post or whatnot. At the, end, at the end of the day, once the malware is in the wild, it is goal is to reach out to a command and control server to receive commands, exfiltrate data, and do whatever whatever nefarious activities on the infected system. That's the whole purpose of having a CNC channel. Now, it could be using either a TCP uh, layer or UDP layer, depending on the protocol and be it like a custom or a uh, standard protocol. Uh, on TCP, you, you could be using, for example, IRC, SNTP, FTP, HTTP, HTTPS, SMB protocol, DNS, ICMP, SSL or TLS. Of course, malware could be could use like any other protocols, not specific to those that I'm just listing. But those are standards, and the malware could leverage them easily without having to innovate on coming up with their own custom protocols. Now, uh, this is an example that shows how a custom protocol that is ASCII-based is uh, constructed at the PECT level. For example, uh, we have this packet, which consists of the following pipe delimited data. It is very simple. First, we have, for example, the word God, which is a could indicate a magic string. It's used like as a unique identifier that the uh, malware server uh, would be expecting one, the malware sends this request to the server. And then followed by the infected system OS version, then the pipe, character, then the host name of the infected system, then the username of the currently logged in account, then followed by the OS bitness, be it 32-bit or 64-bit. So this is a very simple uh, ASCII-based protocol that a lot of malware use when they want to fingerprint the infected system and send such a packet to the uh, backend server. The other example is also a custom protocol, but is binary-based. And one of the most famous uh, binary, custom binary based protocol is the one used by PCRAT, which is also known as uh, GhostRAT, although it's not GhostRAT, it's just that the magic byte is uh, set to the word ghost, but there is no rat known as GhostRAT. This is uh, the source code is, 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 is open source and the original name of the rat is PCRAT, just to set this straight from the beginning. And the structure of this packet in binary format is as follows. First, you have the first five bytes. It's in hex. And they have the word PCRAT in ASCII. So this is a unique identifier that you set at compile time when you want to generate a malware sample via the builder of PCRAT. And then what comes after is a double word value that would indicate the packet size. And then another double word value, which indicates the size of the data that follows, but before Zlib compression. And then what follows after that, for example, you have the 789C is the header for the Zlib compression library and then the Zlib compressed data. So this is a perfect example of how a binary custom protocol looks like. And this is not like unique in any form or shape. Many other malware custom protocol follow similar pattern as well. You will be surprised to see that such a pattern also exists with other uh, malware families too. They might have a byte here, byte there, that would indicate different flags depending on the malware configuration. But at the end of the day, they all sort of follow the same uh, structure. Okay, so also we're still in the introduction section. So at the, at the beginning, you must be aware, back in the days, IRC was sort of like the de facto uh, protocol for uh, malware. Why? Because it was very easy to, uh, just set up uh, an IRC server and have your malware communicate with it without having to invest into setting up the back end component uh, to communicate with the server. 
So you have this one standardized, ready, ready-made for you IRC server, where all your bots can communicate to that channel and be instructed remotely in a, in a very easy and organized way. Uh, but then uh, you have all of these uh, corporations started blocking IRC protocol, right? And it's very easy. You can either block it at the port number or at the semantic level of the protocol via an IDS signature or IQS signature. And then it becomes an issue for malware authors, right? Uh, despite, it how, despite how easy it is to use it, but it's no longer of, uh, it's no longer effective to be used in the wild since blocking it is, it became like a standard policy for all these major corporations. So they started shifting into HTTP protocol, which becomes the standard for uh, malware CNC communications, because it's also at the end of the day, it blends with the normal traffic. So there isn't much of difference between normal traffic and uh, malware traffic, unless you do your, your, your reverse engineering work and, and to figure out what is benign and what is malicious. And that should be, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with it, is text-based protocol, extremely simple. Well, simple is, is again, is, is, is a relative term. Depends on how much you read into the specification, especially when it comes to implementing the actual HTTP uh, protocol in terms of parsing it. Uh, so thus, why the focus is on HTTP and not IRC or any other protocol. Uh, this is like I mentioned, what I'm about to mention next is I know it might seem very uh, straightforward or, or very obvious for some of you, but considering my experience in some teachings at some corporations or, uh, or even like talking to some friends about some of this stuff, it might not be obvious for them, especially if you don't have a background in software engineering or in implementing your own protocol or coding your own TCP, UDP level type protocols, or even HTTP. So these things might seem alien to you. Again, just to mention, a protocol is never defined by its port number. It's just a port number. This is part of the standard. It's a default number. I, again, I understand some protocols other than HTTP, they might have a specific port number that you cannot change, but still, if, um, um, a protocol is never defined by its support number. You can change it at will as long as both the client and the server understand it, then that's fine. It is actually the semantics and the architectural design that defines a protocol. You have to adhere to this grammar. Otherwise, it's not really the protocol that you're talking to. Now, the other misconception is when it comes to Windows, and in particular using either, either of the libraries, Win HTTP or Win INET. So we use these libraries for uh, sending a uh, HTTP request to the, to the server, that there is this uh, misunderstanding that <clears throat> if I am using these libraries, oh, this means that the uh, generated request oh, must be HTTP RFC standard compliant. It's not really the case because it all depends on the implementation of uh, how these libraries work. And the other thing is if you're using Windows socket WinSock library, for example, because you could send uh, a custom TCP packet with this library, or you could construct your own HTTP request, uh, like statically or dynamically, you can have the entire request hard coded or dynamically fill all of the parameters in the request. In your code, you would have to set everything uh, like by yourself, starting from the HTTP method, to the HTTP version, to whatever header you reference. But if you're using this library, it doesn't mean that uh, you're not using HTTP uh, protocol. Again, it's not the library that defines the protocol, it is the protocol semantics itself, and of course, whatever the server is expecting. And the other notes that I want to mention is that malware has full control over the client and server setup, which is fundamentally different from uh, using a, uh, a web browser. A web browser would have to be almost, uh, depending on the company, uh, 100% uh, HTTP RFC compliant to communicate with different HTTP uh, servers. Whereas for malware, no, not really, it need not be the case. Although you might see HTTP traffic on the wire generated by malware, but it need not be HTTP at the same time. And the whole purpose of that would be to camouflage the actual uh, custom protocol that they are communicating with the server within HTTP traffic. So just because you see some HTTP elements in the traffic, it doesn't mean that it is HTTP traffic. So just keep that in mind. We'll see later on in, 
uh, through the cases that we'll be going through. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, HTTP is becoming the de facto protocol for malware CNC communications. And in doing so, it happens that these authors, they committed some interesting mistakes, or I should call blunders, and be it intentional or non-intentional. And this is what makes it interesting, actually, that we don't know if it is intentional or not intentional. For example, you have specific headers in a GET request that only make sense in a POST request, like at the protocol specific specification level. So you might be wondering, so why would the author use such a, like why would the author commit such a mistake? Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you can clearly say that, oh, it's a blatant mistake by the author. He doesn't know what he's doing, just like lots of senior software engineers. And then you also have using wrong content length value that doesn't match the actual payload size. Hmm, so what's happening here? If this is the case, and yet I'm getting a proper HTTP server response, yet the request is not valid, so you might be wondering, ah, oh, is the server backend really HTTP server if it is really like vetting the actual request specification? So those mistakes are interesting in their own, actually, because sometimes you have uh, malware uh, traffic that's not easily filterable via an IDS signature, be it for potential false positive or it might incur a lot of performance impact. So those blunders and mistakes in the request or response of the, uh, of the server, we might leverage them for our own advantage and write uh, IDS, IPS signature to, to, to detect them. So in this, in the rest of the talk, we will go through this journey of documenting such semantic and syntax level type errors. So it's not only typographical, it's not like you have, uh, you see this and uh, written in uh, that as, as that. No, you will see semantic type error as well, as well as syntax level errors. And just before I continue, I just want to mention this that since I'll be uh, putting a lot of uh, packet captures, I should be uh, requests in particular. I just want to mention that the value of the host header field and all of the packet decodes, uh, I have replaced them with uh, with the value example.com since I don't want to mention the actual uh, domain name. And in case it's an IP address, I replace it with 101010101, uh, unless otherwise uh, noted. So, And also, uh, just to mention that all of the malware that I'll be talking about here, uh, in the appendix of the paper, I have uh, all of the MD5 hashes, as well as the malware family name reference as well. So you can look, at, look them up yourself, and they should be available on virus total. So there is no uh, secret here. You can verify everything I say here. So there's a difference of, uh, between coming up with such scenarios uh, versus uh, having uh, something in the wild uh, making such mistakes, so thus uh, like the proof of this work. So first we'll start with the first case of a malware known as PK or Adelenoc. Uh, Adelinoc, depends whichever way you pronounce it. In this particular case, we have the scenario where the content length value does not match the actual payload size. As you can see in the request, the content length value is four, yet the payload size, here the payload, which is shown in hexadecimal, is actually 271 bytes. I'm not showing all the payload size because it's irrelevant. It's only the first four bytes which are in ASCII it translates to P key value. So how, how come this discrepancy? The content length has to hold the value of the payload of the post request. And yet there is no match here. So what happened? When went wrong? How did this happen in the, in the first place? So it is such a blunder that I'm talking about. So, in case you're wondering how the malware does it when it comes to cal calculating the size of the entire packet, this is what it does. So first, it initializes a buffer to zero, like the buffer is initialized on the heap, to a size of 431 bytes. And that buffer is set to zero initially. So the buffer is cleared to zero. 
of a size 431 bytes. And keep in mind that the actual valid size of the packet is actually 164 bytes. So it's not, it's, it's not 431 bytes as per the uh, buffer size. It is 164, but 164 bytes only. And uh, to calculate the size, it uses the following uh, I don't know, equation, I should say. So first, it gets the length of the URI file name. In this case, it would be length.php, followed by this hard-coded constant, which is 0x90, and then followed by the length of p key. Oh, interesting. At least in this calculation, he is accounting only for the string p key, but not when it comes to uh, uh, parsing the actual payload. And then it gets the length of the domain name. And here, I'm translating it to the same size of the domain that is used with the malware. But it's just a fictional name. And then followed by uh, the addition of uh, 104 hex by y, 104, y is your x9. I have no idea why. And then it comes to a total of 431 bytes, which is exactly the size of uh, the buffer on the heap. But this does not match the actual size of the packet. Um, so you might be wondering if this is a deliberate mistake or a non-deliberate mistake. Honestly, it is a non-deliberate mistake, and this is a blatant mistake by the author. Uh, because the, the content language value is set to four, and the payload honestly is supposed to hold only the value P key uh, without the rest of the zeros. But in this case, the malware was using the uh, Winsock library and it uses the, uh, the send API function. Uh, so in this case, uh, no library would complain about sending such requests to the server. Uh, so yeah, this is what happened in this case. And unfortunately at the time of when testing this request, uh, like with the actual malicious domain, the server wasn't, uh, uh, alive at that time to confirm this hypothesis, be it like a deliberate mistake or non-deliberate mistake. Uh, so this is one aspect of this uh, anomaly in this request. And the other one is the missing of the user agent uh, header field. Although it's not like an anomaly on its own, but you don't get to see that much of uh, valid requests without the user agent uh, field. This is just something to keep in mind when you want to mine for malicious traffic or any anomalous traffic on the network. So this is a peaky malware. Now we go into uh, another interesting malware case. And this is quite interesting. And I'm also requesting uh, additional insight from any of the attendees that are willing to provide in case uh, they see it differently from what I see it. So I call it the reverse gear uh, scenario. So first, you have a malware that's running on your infected system, right? And then it establishes TCP connection with the server. And right after establishing that connection, the malware actually sends this request that's showing in this particular slide. Yes, you might be wondering, this is a server response. It's not a request looking uh, packet. No, this is what it sends. The malware sends this request to the server, but this looks like it's coming from the server, right? So for you, first of all, I'm pretty sure 100% that all of you would think this is a valid HTTP request. When you look at Wireshark, I mean, there is no denying that it's a valid HTTP request, irrespective of the directionality of this request, which still doesn't make sense. But let's go with the assumption that it's a valid and whatnot. And in the request itself, you see that the server is set to SFFE, which is literally a uh, Google uh, web server. And then the contact length to 53, and then your connection set to keep alive, and then you have the actual payload. So the payload is exclusive or encrypted. Uh, and yeah, uh, I mean, here are a couple of other interesting things to keep in mind as well. You see that there is no comma between the uh, the header field name as well as the value. For example, the content length, 
the value 53, like usually in normal traffic, typical traffic, you would see after the column space followed by the value. The same goes for the connection keep alive header. It is not a violation of the specification when you see such uh, syntax, but it is anomalous. That's all there is to it. So just keep that in mind when you want to, again, mine uh, your network traffic looking for any abnormal uh, uh, traffic. Uh, of course, here you can tell that the malware is trying to blend with Google Web Server traffic. But seriously, like if this malware was running on a corporate network and what? The corporate network is using Google Web Server and uh, this request is uh, originating from uh, your corporate network with SFFE uh, server. Of course, it doesn't make sense. Uh, again, in this particular scenario, the malware was using the uh, WS232 uh, library and it uses the send and receive uh, APIs. The other thing that you need to keep in mind in this scenario is that mm, this entire request is actually hard coded, of course, other than the payload. The payload, again, as I mentioned, contains a unique string, which is exclusive for encrypted with the key 77. Uh, so yeah, so after sending this request, again, remember this is a request, not the response. The server responds with this request, <laughs> okay? It's actually not requesting anything from the malware. Although it's a GET request, but it's not requesting anything from the malware. Again, there are lots of anomalies in this request too. A GET that comes with a payload. Of course, you would expect a payload to be associated with a POST request, not a GET request. Again, this is not a violation of the uh, RFC, but nonetheless, how often do you see a payload associated with a GET request in a legitimate benign traffic? almost non-existent, almost. And the other anomaly is the host header is set to the loopback address. Seriously? So you have a uh, malware CNC server sending a GET request to the malware itself with the host header set to the loopback address. Of course, it's just fake because at the time when you establish TCP connection, you, uh, you, you use the actual correct malicious IP address and all of this is totally irrelevant unless you're uh, going through a proxy or whatnot, and then th this becomes an important field. In this case, again, the payload is exclusive or encrypted uh, with the same key, and it, 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 it contains sort of uh, a magic string. The couple length value surprising is actually correct. Uh, what else can I say about this one? It is missing user agent header field. But yeah, this is, this is it for this particular request. So again, remember, this is the uh, server response, not the malware request. Uh, and just to give you an idea as why this might be confusing, because when the malware receives this request from the server, it does not parse the HTTP request, despite what Wireshark is telling you that this is HTTP. It is actually only, it's exclusive ordering the entire payload, including the header and everything because the exclusive or is stream-based and exclusive or the entire payload, it's gonna end up exclusive oring the payload, uh, the payload of the request and uh, having the full uh, decrypted uh, magic string. And then it does a string match looking for that magic string anywhere in the payload, which is a very silly way of having to do all of that. I mean, I understand that the malware is trying to blend with the uh, rest of the legitimate traffic, but it's still. So again, this is a clear indication that we're not dealing with HTTP traffic at all, actually. The actual malware communication protocol is in the payload of these requests, in the request and the server response. So it has nothing to do with HTTP. HTTP are used only as a camouflaging mechanism. That's all. And for the untrained eye, this might go unnoticed for sure. So in this, in this particular case, if you decide like you wanna, uh, like how would you detect such anomaly uh, on the wire, right? So you might ask yourself like, what kind of signature would I write to detect this traffic? Uh, I mean, there are lots of indicators that you can 
account for. But generalizing such detection is not actually that simple without incurring lots of performance impact on whatever device you use, be it Snort or any other commercial uh, product. So you have also to account for the uh, net flow context in this particular case. So for example, going back to uh, this request that is going to the server, I mean, you can enforce the directionality of the request with the server being like holding the value as FFFE. And if this is going back, like uh, going outbound from your network, then of course it stands out and you should alert on it. At least it's the minimum you should do. Uh, I'm not going to focus on the detection aspect of the actual malware payload. This is very easy. It goes without saying. So this is that for the reverse and uh, gear case. And my request for the audience is, if you have any other insight as to why the malware, sorry, or yeah, why the malware author would use such reverse directionality, please let me know if you have some other uh, creative insight. So now we go into another uh, malware uh, known as Proton Bot. Uh, this is also another interesting uh, case. And the specifics of this request is uh, the content type header that is associated with a GET request. Sorry. Uh, but how so? Usually, GET requests don't have a uh, content type. It is used to signal to the server what type of data it's being sent. So if I am posting data to the server, I am telling the server I'm posting X data with this content type. So expect this content type of the data that I'm sending. But in a GET request, what kind of content type data that I'm sending? As actually, as per the RFC, content type is used in the post or put request methods. And if it is used, if content type is used as part of the server response, it means that it is informing the agent, whoever is receiving this request, about the type of data that the server is sending. So again, it indicates the type of data that either I'm receiving or I'm sending. So if you try to load this PCAP with this particular uh, HTTP packet, actually even Wireshark wouldn't be able to parse it correctly and it will err on it because content type doesn't make sense and you get request. So uh, so this one is actually, is, it is a semantic type error. Uh, it is a violation and shouldn't happen on, in, in legitimate traffic. So, I mean, checking for such uh, anomaly on your network uh, is easy, but again, you're gonna have to keep in mind the performance impact of whatever signature, right? Uh, especially if you're doing these things in real time. So you could easily check, for example, for the presence of the content type header in any request method other than put or post. Uh, again, uh, you can use these uh, performance uh, intense signature for data manic, for example, you don't ma you don't care much about performance uh, since it's not in, in in real time. So it's still valid to generalize your detection methods. So this is for Proton uh, bot case. Now we'll move into another malware case. This is what I call the crosswalk case. And this one is a bit interesting, and it is based on my own interpretation of what is the likelihood, the cause of this error, and what infliction it might cause should you be attempting to parse the server response on your own. The issue with this particular case is the value of the content length header in the server response. So first, you see the malware sending this get request with the custom header, again, custom header, DCY. This is custom header and then there's nothing wrong with that. Remember, back in the days, custom header has to start with the uh, characters X uppercase that followed by dash followed by the custom header name. 
this was dropped later on and then it became that you can come up with whatever uh, a custom header name you want. It did not follow any specific uh, standardization other than the specifics of the, the other headers uh, have to follow. So it became even more difficult to fingerprint custom headers from legitimate header unless you wanna look for uh, like whitelisting or blacklisting stuff. But that's also very expensive. And in the, again, in, in the get request, you see the content length header with a value of zero. I've seen this many times, actually. It's, 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 it's very surprising to see it, actually. It's just waste of space. And uh, I mean, I'm not sending anything. There is no payload associated with the get request. Why do I even have to uh, use this header? There is no point of using it at all, especially if it, it has a value of zero. And I've seen it like in malware and legitimate applications too. So it's probably that, like for example, in the case of legitimate applications that whoever is implementing such request doesn't know what he's doing, he or she. So that's that. But here, just, just to mention in the, in the custom header, this is how the malware is exfiltrating data. It is basics for encoded as, as you can tell. Uh, so after the sending such request, the server responds with uh, this, uh, response with these uh, headers. Now, what stands out the most, of course, is the content length value. I mean, of course, it doesn't make sense at all. Uh, like the value, this is in bytes. In megabytes, this is like about uh, 524 uh, megabyte. Uh, the actual payload in the, in, the, in the server response actually is only 256 bytes. Yet the content length value is such value, such very huge value. So you might ask yourself, but why? How such decrepancy? Like, what happened? What went wrong here? Again, just keep in mind, going back to the library things on Windows. Uh, so the malware is not using any HTTP library, actually. It is the WinSOC. And uh, yep, it's using the uh, WinSOC library. And uh, all right, sorry about that. So yeah, the WinSock library. And for receiving such requests, it uses the uh, function receive. Uh, so it's not using any HTTP library that will parse the content length header, gets the value, and then allocates a buffer on the heap with that value, and then moves the actual payload into that uh, buffer. So the malware itself is not vulnerable to such mistake, actually. It is uh, the malware analyst or malware researcher or whatnot, whatever you want to call it, who is vulnerable to this. Uh, because if you're trying to automate some uh, milking processes, like if you want to send these requests by yourself to the server and expecting something in, in return, like you want to milk like the server response at specific uh, point in time, you want to automate this process or whatnot, so usually this is how you would do it, like uh, in, a, in, a, in a standardized uh, fashion. You would use some HTTP library or even your own parsing mechanism. You go to the content length, get the value, allocate a buffer on the heap, and then get the payload. So if you attempting to uh, uh, allocate such buffer like multiple times within the same process, you might run out actually of uh, memory on, on, on your system. Now, if this is a, uh, a blunder, uh, or is it uh, an intended mistake? I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually puzzled as, as to why this is happening. But this is something to keep in mind. And again, how would you detect such an anomaly on the network? It's the same as with the other case that I talked about previously, when the content length value doesn't match the payload in the request, but here it is in the server response. So you can check for the value and you can check the payload as well and see if the length matches or not. Again, this is expensive because there is nothing unique that you're accounting for in your, in your signature. But for data mining, this is gold. So keep that in mind. Now we go into another malware case, which is also interesting, just like the rest of the cases. And what's interesting about this one is the use of illegal characters in a given header name 
And in this case, it happened to be the connection header with the value close. You can see here, we have the value open parentheses followed by the string null, followed by the closing parentheses. So this is a violation of the RFC actually. This is not allowed. A header field name should not contain illegal characters. Uh, you might be surprising from what I'm about to say that in this particular case, when the man was sent this request to the server, the server was running Apache version two and the server did respond actually with the status code 200 okay. Hmm, so how come? If this header is a violation of the RFC, get the server just happily accepted this request and responded with 200 okay. Uh, when I tested this request myself, I mean, just taking like this anomaly into consideration and sending it to the latest version of Apache, all locally, of course, not to the malware server. Actually, the, uh, the server did reject this request. And I got back uh, a 400 bad, uh, bad request status code. So this means that it's either a modified version on the, uh, like as a part of the uh, malware backend server, although it's the same server like Apache Apache, but it's a different version. Or here it lacks some of the restrictions uh, when configuring the server. Uh, testing the same request on Nginx web server, uh, I also get back Uh, actually, surprisingly, Nginx server uh, does not inspect any header for such anomalies. So you could have this illegal character anywhere in any of the headers, and Nginx will still happily accept the request and not complaining at all. Uh, we'll go later on, uh, hopefully in the next slide, I suppose, as to why this is happening, why this discrepancy between different servers. Uh, again, um, Detecting such request, uh, like in terms of generalizing the detection, might not be easy without incurring a lot of performance impact, but you can check for the presence of any illegal characters in the header uh, field name. And you can get the list of illegal characters from the RFC specifications. Speaking of illegal characters, Socknet is not the only malware that committed such a, a mistake. We also have these two additional malware families known as Cobra and Italk. In the first case, we see white spaces at the end of every uh, line in the HTTP request, starting even from the HTTP method line, all the way to the HTTP version, followed by the rest of the headers. So you see a space character at the end of every header or every line in the request, I should say. To send this request, the malware, the malware uses the OneSock uh, library and it uses the send uh, function. So again, it's not using any uh, particular HTTP library. Uh, just so you know, in this case, the malware is actually exfiltrating data through the cookie. This is irrelevant to the talk, but just so you know. And at the time of uh, testing this uh, request, the server actually wasn't responding. So I didn't get to see what uh, the server would respond to, to such request. But I doubted that the uh, server is HTTP compliant. Uh, probably it can just like of a custom HTTP parser or whatnot, because all it cares about is the cookie uh, uh, header that it would parse and uh, get whatever exfiltrated data that it's looking for. Now, I tested the same request against Nginx with these uh, wider spaces. Again, it returned a 200 OK status code. So it happily, it happily accepted such request. Whereas in the case of Apache server, actually the server rejected it with the 400 uh, status code. Exclusively if the wider space is after the protocol version number like on the, as shown in the, uh, on the first uh, line. So for Apache, if you have 
white space character at the end of the first line, it will be rejected. So it all depends on the stringentness of uh, the parsing of the request. Uh, in the case of ITAC, the second request, there are lots of anomalies actually. Uh, again, you see the connection uh, preceded with the white space illegal character. Uh, and uh, surprisingly, again, this request was accepted by the server uh, and didn't complain about it at all. But what is interesting is that this GET request also sends the uh, payload, which has a value of uh, 0, 0, and hex. And there is no content length header associated with this request. You might be wondering why, because I, I, I have no clue why. So this could be like a blunder. It's not an intended mistake or whatever. But all of these help us into detecting this traffic. Because otherwise, uh, if it wasn't for these blunders, like there is nothing unique about the request that would allow us to detect it in a, uh, in a, in a, in a blocking fashion. And actually, a similar case uh, was outlined by Fox and Anti when it comes to the white spaces. Fox at Intel, uh, they talked about a particular version of COBOL Strike Server known as Nano HTTPD, used in, in, in Java servers, whereby the, uh, there is an external space uh, right after the status code in the server response. And that's how they managed to uh, fingerprint all active COBOL Strike Server on the internet. So they scanned all the IPv4, uh, addresses and they managed to identify all of the uh, active COBOL strike servers because of this unique abnormality in the server response that is a space right after the uh, HTTP status code. So this is how you could leverage such mistakes to your advantage. Now we're going to another case, which is what I call the mysterious case of Cloaca. Again, this is another similar one to the white spaces one. But here, it's not at the beginning of the header field name. It is at the end of it. Now, what's interesting here is that other than that white space is an illegal character, it is the fact that you're not allowed to have uh, a space between the header field value and the column. This is also a violation as per the RFC. So here you have even an illegal character. Actually, it doesn't matter anymore because it's an illegal character which supersedes any other violations, like in terms of order of parsing. Uh, as, as you can see in the host header, and uh, you can see the other anomaly is in the accept header. There is no accept uh, open parentheses, dash encoding, closing parentheses header, like as part of a custom header. Of course, this is a blatant mistake, or probably whoever wrote this malware doesn't know what he's, he or she is doing. And yet, again, just to mention, as per the RFC, no white space is allowed between the header field name and column. Like, this is verbatim copy from the RFC. It's not my own wording. And as per the RFC, sending such request, the server must reject it with a response code of 400 meaning a bad request. And why? Like, why would the RFC enforce uh, such restriction? It is all for security purposes. And uh, I'm not sure if you remember, um, like the CVE 2019-16276 in the uh, Go HTTP library known as Net HTTP. And actually, it is, it's a similar case, and they end up with... Uh, with the CVE, you can look it up and read about it. So those mistakes there could turn into some serious uh, vulnerabilities. They look uh, sort of uh, uh, how, like how how to say it, uh, not too severe. It's it's just a space after the header uh, field name, but the implications are very severe actually. Of course, depending on the context or whatnot. And another thing to note here that Cloaca actually constructs this request uh, manually. 
and it uses the socket library, uh, so no HTTP library, to send this request. Again, surprisingly, the server accepted this request without any uh, complaint at all. And for this particular case, the server um, was running Apache with PHP version 5.3.28. How did that happen? I have no clue. But again, you will see later on what could be the reason of these servers accepting these requests without any complaint. And in case you want to know why, it's all uh, going to come to you in the next slide. And so what would be the reason for accepting or rejecting a request that does not adhere to the specification? Uh, like even if you are committing some serious mistakes in the request, uh, it all goes to what's known as the robustness principle, which is clearly specified in the RFC 2145. And it says, in general, an implementation must be conservative in its sending behavior, okay? And liberal in its receiving behavior. Aha, so this explains it, technically speaking. It must be liberal in its receiving behavior. That is, it must be careful to send well-formed datagrams but must accept any data gun that it can interpret. So it's gonna keep parsing whatever it accepts, not object to technical errors where the meaning is still clear. Aha, uh -huh. so this EG actually clearly mentioned that as long as it's gonna still accept the request as it is. So it's not gonna have any unintended consequences, apparently. Of course, this is implementation and interpretation dependent, whereby different HTTP servers did not behave the same way. So as you can see, this is not mathematical equation. This is uh, English uh, language, meaning that if I'm imp implementing an HTTP server myself, I could interpret the same thing differently from another person in implementing the same specifications and have fun uh, enforcing such a standard. I mean, even implementing a compiler with uh, like C++ with a very, very strict RFC, uh, you still end up with uh, unintended consequences. Get it is a compiler. So how about uh, implementing a, a, a protocol like HTTP, which is text-based and it's not math. So this is what we go wrong, technically speaking. It's up to the implementer. Uh, it depends on whose mood it could be, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, here we go into some more uh, generalized uh, mistakes, uh, more interesting ones too. Uh, first, uh, I talk about uh, the many cases of malware accept header blunders. So the accept header, when you see it in a, in, a, in a request, it's literally meant to signal to the server what content type the client is able to understand. So when I send a request to the server, be it a get, a get request, for example, and I have this accept with whatever value that it takes, I'm telling the server that this is the type of data I'm expecting from you. I cannot accept anything else. Of course, it depends on whatever accept value that is specifying in the request. And the accept header value has this syntax. This is not my own syntax. This is as per RFC. So first you have the mem type, followed by forward slash, followed by the subtype. Or you have mem type, followed by forward slash, followed by anything, so any subtype. Or you could have any mem type, followed by forward slash, followed by any subtype. So you have these three combinations only, okay? And the mem type and the subtypes, they're already uh, listed in these specifications. So you, so you can have uh, uh, a whitelist of all the possible values uh, that these types could take. Uh, so what I did uh, is as simple as follows. I checked for the absence of the forward slash in the accept header field against uh, uh, 
uh, two, seven, six, nine uh, packet catchers. They are all malicious, all malware uh, packet catchers. And what I ended up with is the identification of 18 malware families that lacks the forward slash in the accept header. So some of them, they were empty. Like the accept, the accept header has zero value. Others, they have the value XML, just on its own XML. Another is you have the anything followed by dot, not forward slash, followed by dot. And one of them has a, a domain name in it. And one of them, nonsense value, like non nonsensical, completely irrelevant value, like binary type value that doesn't make sense at all. So I only checked for the absence of the forward slash, which, which has to accept, which has to exist as per the syntax and the specification. And I ended up identifying 18 malware families. So this means that I was able to fingerprint malicious traffic, malicious between double codes, without looking for any for uh, any unique uh, or specific malware traffic. So this is the power of uh, checking for any abnormalities at the protocol level, or syntax slash semantic level. Of course, you can generalize such detection. It did not be only the absence of the forward slash. And you, I'm pretty sure you will come up with different results, even better results. But this is just an example to illustrate what you could do to uh, detect anomalous traffic on your network. Uh, of course, we're gonna keep talking about accept headers because apparently it's uh, it's uh, it's one not to be missed. And uh, malware author seems to like to uh, make mistakes in this header a lot. I don't know why. What's so unique about it? So you have this another malware. Uh, this malware is actually used in a targeted attack against some Vietnamese entities. And it arrives via the exploitation of a given vulnerability in a Microsoft Office document. Uh, the request itself is actually is not uh, uh, filterable. There is nothing unique about the request as it stands from uh, a data perspective, meaning like the payload is dynamically generated by the malware via the call of co uh, create the GUID, so it just creates a unique ID on the affected system and sends it out. The content length value is correct. And nothing else, the user agent value is correct. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's a standard. There's nothing unique about it. Even the URL is, 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 is very benign. What stands out is the accept header, which is quite an interesting mistake. So here you see the XM dot application. There is no such value in the uh, accept header, like as part of the specification. So it's clearly a mistake. Uh, how did the author commit such mistake? I have no clue. They, they probably deleted, uh, erased some stuff while uh, coding this uh, request. The actual correct value should be this one, XML followed by comma followed by application. So this is how you would detect this request actually. Actually, this is the only way you could detect this request. So this is another blunder. Now we go into uh, another header, the cookie header. It's oddities and peculiarities. We must have all seen the cookie header used in so many different ways. And uh, its use is known that it's used for tracking, session management, or customization. So every time you log in into some server, rest assured, most likely the cookie is involved. And usually it is requested by the server via the set cookie header to store whatever cookie on the client side. Whether it is uh, for tracking you, I mean, from private perspective, or for storing whatever data for later uh, retrieval. And it has the following uh, syntax. This is as per RFC as well. 
you have cookie header name followed by uh, this key value pairs followed by the semicolon followed by space followed by other key value pairs and so on you can have as many as as you want now remember the separation between the key value pairs is semicolon followed by space so out of curiosity see if any malware would deviate from such syntax i checked for the absence of the separator equal like that separates the key from the value and to my surprise after checking the same set of pcaps as in the previous case i ended up with the following that is the identification of additional 13 malware families whereby nine of them have zero uh, cookie header value, nothing at all. One of them has uh, uh, spaces, and if three of them were exfiltrating data to the cookie header. This is just by checking for the absence of the equal character. And uh, in the same case, I, uh, I checked for the pair separator, that is the semicolon, uh, such that it's not followed by space. And in this case, I got a, like, in my data set, uh, I was able to fingerprint this malware family known as Nubot, which is not part of the original data set, uh, which exfiltrate data via the cookie header, actually. Now, you might say, uh, this is not too malicious. The, uh, the check for the uh, semicolon, such that it's not followed by space. It's funny, the specification clearly say this is how we should code it and this is how we should parse it. But of course, you will get to see actually some of the same violation in the, uh, in, in the semicolon and the next uh, key value pairs. But nonetheless, just keep in mind in case you're mining your own uh, network traffic. Uh, Another uh, interesting cookie and some other uh, header mistakes is, uh, is in this malware family known as Cephnet, which is uh, an old malware family. I don't think it's selective at all, actually. But uh, for documentation purposes, it's still interesting to uh, talk about it. And of course, as you can see here, what stands out the most is, again, the cookie which literally ends with, like holds this hexadecimal value and ends with a dot, which is interesting, a dot. Um, of course, I mean, this is obviously something stands out here and you should be suspicious of this request when you see it on your, on your network. The other observation in this request is the content length value. As you can see here, the payload is zero, zero without uh, the CRLF separator, which you should have two, as per the specification to separate the headers from the payload. But here, there is only one. So this is another major violation. And of course, the value does not match the size of the payload. Again, we uh, have been through this before in the other cases. Uh, this is also a clear violation. And then you have the more uh, blatant mistake that is the use of the max forwards header with this very large value. So the max forwards header is actually used with either of the HTTP methods, trace or options. And it, uh, not, not a get request. And it is literally used for limiting the number of forwards the proxies have to carry. Uh, of course, uh, can you imagine this request going through a proxy? And that many number of proxies, 107,000, 7, 1900 uh, uh, proxies until it reaches its destination. Of course, this value does not represent the intended meaning of, or does not hold the intended meaning of this header. It is actually a dynamically generated value by the malware, which is used for uh, uh, like signaling to the server that, hey, this is the port that I'll be using for listening. So this malware is telling the server that this is the port I'll be using for listening for any other coming messages 
uh, when it opens another uh, TCP uh, channel. And of course, as you must have figured out already, this request won't be parsed correctly by Wireshark because lots of violations in this case. And again, this request was sent by uh, the WS232 library using the uh, send API. And uh, it uses the receive function to receive whatever it's expecting from the server. So no HTTP library was used uh, in this particular case. Sorry, I'm just taking a sip of water. Now we'll move into another case, what I call silencing, silencing silence, while well, silence is the name of the malware, which is also known as TrueBot. And this one again is, I mean, it's very obvious just by looking at the, the packet, uh, like the TCP stream and it's in, AXI for, and it's in ASCII format. And you can tell that the user agent value holds the value of uh, two lines. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't make sense. You can see it in the hex dump as well as in the uh, in the ASCII uh, stream. You can see that 0D0A as part of the user agent header value. Now we call that uh, for HTTP 1.1 version, uh, the request has to at least hold the header host for it to be valid and accepted by the server. Again, it really depends on uh, how the uh, developer interpret the specifications and uh, whether it allows such requests or not. But as per the specification for version 1.1, the get request has to have at least the host header. But as you can tell here, it does not have the host header. It does exist in the request. But when you send this request and the server receives it, what it's gonna see is the first line the user agent with empty value, and then it's gonna take the host and the connection header as, as part of the payload and not, not part of the header request because of the uh, 0D0A, 0D0A separation. Uh, so, and yet in this case, uh, I don't know if the, if the uh, server accepted this request or not, at that, because at the time of uh, testing this request to the actual malicious server, the server wasn't alive to uh, verify this uh, hypothesis. But it should definitely be rejected nonetheless. And of course, loading this with a Wireshark, uh, Wireshark would complain about it, of course, with the message uh, leading CRLF previous messages in the stream may have extra CRLF. This is actually not enough of, of an error. There are other uh, major problem with this request. But this you can see that malware authors sometimes uh, sort of innovate when uh, making uh, such mistakes. So it's not only in the accept header, but any header. And in case you're wondering, how did they end up with this mistake? You can see it here in the slide. Uh, so, I mean, the malware uses the uh, Windows HTTP services, the Win HTTP library for sending this request. And to initialize the Win HTTP functions uh, and returns like an HTTP session handle, uh, it calls the this uh, API, the Win HTTP open, which takes the, uh, like the value of different uh, headers. And in this case, we can see that the user agent header is taking the uh, double new line uh, value. So the mistake is very obvious in the code. Uh, looks like uh, not only uh, senior engineers don't uh, code edit their code, even malware authors don't edit their code. So this one is, is actually, I think this is important. And uh, it's a statistical analysis on the same set of PCAPs, the 2769 malicious slash malware PCAPs, looking for different anomalies in the user agent header and see if we can come up or identify 
uh, malware that deviates from uh, the norm, at least. So in the first case, what I did is I checked for uh, the presence of the plus character in the user agent uh, header value. And to my surprise, I got back uh, 15 malware families. So all of them that use HTTP traffic, they, have, they use the plus character in the uh, HTTP user agent. I mean, yes, you can say that it is not malicious on its own because sometimes it is substituted for space characters instead. And it's a user agent header value. Uh, you can also sort of innovate on what characters you use in this uh, header because it's supposed to hold the uh, the name of the client that's making the request. So it's not uh, unique in any form or shape as per the RFC. There is no white listing uh, list. And um, I mean, this, this exception that I'm talking about is the, uh, you have this, uh, the malware family known as uh, Bistafera, uh, which uses actually the Google bot uh, user agent value. And as you can see, you have the uh, leading plus character uh, for the uh, Google uh, domain uh, URL. Uh, the other uh, test that I did is to check for the uh, ampersand in the user agent header value. Again, I, I got uh, this Allurian malware family, and you can see the value that it actually holds, which looks like, or not looks like, it is actually the case that these are HTTP parameters. So you would expect to see this in the URI, not in the user agent. So this is a very easy way to identify such anomaly. And again, Danbot, uh, like, uh, which was also found by SecureWorks, uh, also committed such very similar mistake as well, where the reference, not sorry, the, the, the end percent was found in the user agent header value. The third case is uh, the presence of the equal character in the user agent header value. And I ended up with the identification of eight additional malware families. And all that happened to be exfiltrating data in the user agent uh, uh, header except for one, it's still malicious, but the mistake is, is, is uh, quite funny, uh, which as you can tell here, there is a repetition of the user agent header field twice, followed by equal instead of column, which is nice. So this is another way to uh, uh, identify this request on the network. The fourth case is checking for the uh, backslash in the user agent. Again, I ended up with seven malware families. So just checking for these, I mean, they need not be called illegal characters as much as uh, um, non-common characters and legitimate uh, user agent values, or at least known user agent uh, values. I mean, of course, you can come up with your own characters, or it depends on your character creativity or whatever you can come up with looking for anything anomalous in these headers. So this is just an example, just to give you an idea of uh, how you can uh, fingerprint uh, anomalous traffic, be it for specific malware family or any other type of uh, malicious uh, uh, components on your network without having any specific signature. So such detection outlive any other uh, malware uh, signature because it's very generalized and it targets the, uh, the syntax or the semantics of the protocol itself. Um, I wasn't happy enough with the user agent. So I said, okay, so let me check for other HTTP headers uh, that do not use uh, commonly used characters. Uh, and in this case, I checked for the content disposition header. Usually this, uh, this header takes either of the values in line, attachment, form data, or name, or file name. So what I did, I just checked 
uh, I mean, I, I parsed it correctly and then looking for any value other than, other, other than any of these uh, RFC defined values. And again, I got this malware known as Nalodu. And uh, as you can see here in the uh, request, it is uh, holding a value that doesn't make much sense, which is clearly uh, like some sort of identifier used by the malware. Uh, so yeah, and as you can tell here again, the user agent holds computer specific information, meaning the malware is exfiltrating data through the user agent in a header. Uh, the, these, these checks, they are very, very easy to uh, implement, except for the fact that they are uh, very um, uh, performance and, uh, intensive. But for data mining, they are very good. Now, this uh, presentation wouldn't be complete, actually, at all, without uh, spotting an actual corrective, what I call corrective mistake in the uh, referrer header. As you might be familiar already, the referrer, like the, uh, the word referrer in the HTTP protocol is used in the wrong uh, fashion. I mean, uh, it's used with one R. And if in case you are interested about the etymology of uh, how did this end up in the uh, HTTP RFC with the wrong word, not with the double R? Please uh, look it up uh, on Wikipedia. Uh, but suffice to say that uh, this ultra locker malware family used it in the correct form as per the English language, not the RFC specifications. And it used it with double R. So this is just to, I just wanted to mention this. Of course, you can. Uh, 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 detect this as as as, uh, as something suspicious on your network, but interesting to see that uh, somebody committed this mistake. Actually, they are adamant that it has to be double R. It cannot be one R. So yeah, and uh, surprisingly, just a bit of statistics here. Uh, so only eight out of two seventy six uh, nine malware families actually uh, have their further header field in their request. Uh, I'm actually surprised uh, because uh, to blend with the rest of the normal traffic on your network, malware uh, also they should actually use their further header, or it's sort of like legitimize even further the HTTP request. And uh, some other interesting uh, checks that you can do yourself as well is checking for the case sensitivity. Again, this is not a violation of the RFC, uh, like whether the header is uppercase, lowercase, or whatnot. But in normal traffic, there is sort of like standard that everyone follows. That is, the first character is uppercase, and then what follows is lowercase. I mean, if you've looked at enough uh, network traffic, you can clearly uh, see it. So what I did just to see if I can spot anything interesting in the in the same set of uh, malware PCAPs, I literally checked for the case sensitivity of these list of headers such that they are all in, in lower case. So if I had to check for the pragam, pragam, it should be pragma, uh, I get six malware families. And the same thing goes for the rest of the headers. I mean, just for cache control, all lower case, I get nine. Now they use it. Now here, keep in mind, for the user agent, uh, actually the lib uh, SFML library. I mean, it's, it's a very famous library for uh, uh, if you want to write like that. It's it's for writing games, but it comes with the network module and the file system module and the sound module and whatnot. It actually has all of these header hard coded, and uh, they are all written, written in lowercase. So it's not just by seeing a lowercase the uh, headers; it means uh, the traffic is suspicious. But it's just something to keep in mind, especially when you want to take this into consideration in addition to something else and then tie all of these together and then uh, come to a verdict whether the request is malicious or not. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, here, 
the other thing that stands out is the uh, color disposition. I get 10. And surprisingly, just checking by the lower case, uh, I found a family that was actually sending control commands via the uh, Kana disposition header in the request and the response. Uh, the other one, uh, in the endeavor of checking for sensitivity in the request, that is, I checked for the get method such that it's all lowercase. And surprisingly, I get to my family that uses it in it is a, a lowercase format. Whereas for the post case, I got zero. This just like uh, statistical stuff, but it's something to keep in mind again. And um, the other one is I checked for the HTTP string uh, in the request, like when you send a GET request or any HTTP request, you have the HTTP followed by the version number, right? So I checked for it such that it's all lowercase. And funnily enough, I was able to identify this uh, blue summer malware family. Like the rest of the request, they use a standard uh, uh, capitalization, uh, except for the HTTP string in the uh, request. Uh, and the other anomaly is the use of this accept header uh, that uses uh, the value hs-uk, which actually is not a part of the specification. So I'm not sure from where did the author came up with this, uh, uh, with this value. Uh, the other thing that you can check for is the, the zero spacing. Uh, sorry, I should mention this just to show it. Um, uh, the zero spacing between the column and the value of the header. Again, I mean, it's not a violation but it's just something to keep in mind. And again, like you can see here in this request, you can see like the uh, the comma, I mean, the, I mean, it's not, it's not that it's, it's a violation again, but it does separate both values, but you would expect it to come right after the uh, first value and then followed by deflate. But just something to keep in mind. It, it's, it's actually, it's not that hard to generalize the detection for these anomalies at all, actually. After uh, going through the paper yourself, you can come up with whatever signatures. Um, I talked about uh, empty headers, like when I talk about some of those statistical analysis, uh, but I will revisit it in the next slide and you will see that we have the malware family known as BeRich which used in limited targeted attacks and it was delivered via this uh, vulnerability. I think it's an uh, Internet Explorer vulnerability. So this is a targeted attack. So we would expect that the third actor is, um, uh, is a very uh, articulate and meticulous uh, in terms of uh, uh, coding, interacting with the server and have, have like, having everything uh, adhere to the specification or whatnot, but it's not the case actually. And surprisingly, you get to see like these empty headers, like the accept encoding header has an empty value, for example, right? Uh, why? I don't know. Uh, it's just, it is what it is. It's just a blatant mistake. Uh, so you can easily check for that to fingerprint such uh, anomaly on the network. Now we're done with all the cases. I'm just here. Sorry, I'm losing my, uh, my voice. <clears throat> uh, just some other consideration that you should keep in mind. And it's some of the stuff that I try to play with to see what other anomalies that I can uh, identify and some of the uh, available public source uh, servers. Uh, for example, if you uh, send some request against uh, Nginx or uh, Apache, with an HTTP version other than uh, like 0 0.9, 1, 1 1.1 or 2, in case you're upgrading your HTTP request. Uh, actually, the server does accept the request just happily. I'm not sure if, are you guys aware of HTTP version 8, version 15? So I'm not sure why would they accept this request. I don't know. But it's just something like I found surprising. And the other thing that you have to keep in mind when writing these uh, or checking for these anomalies is that you have to be port agnostic. 
This goes back to my pain point at the beginning of the uh, presentation. If protocol is never defined by its support number, so should your signature. And uh, again, as you can see, implementation is still a subjective interpretation. If uh, I wake up one morning, I don't have my coffee and I wanna implement some feature, I'm sure it's gonna affect my own understanding of that uh, language uh, paragraph, uh, like that English language uh, paragraph. And um, case in point, I'm sure you must have heard of the HTTP request to smuggling attacks, which actually could illustrate what could go wrong in case the developer of uh, the HTTP specification does not uh, understand, clearly understand what the specification says. And you can up with some serious implications in terms of uh, vulnerabilities. And, uh, and uh, like the first uh, request to smuggling uh, research was carried out in 2005 by Watchfire. And then uh, an additional research was carried out recently by uh, Portswiger in 2019. And they are still actually uh, doing additional research on it. Like every now and then they come up with additional blog posts uh, that illustrate this, uh, this, this, this case. And um, uh, so yeah, this is something to keep in mind. And I recommend that you read over this uh, request of smuggling uh, reborn uh, uh, attack because this is clearly uh, a case that needs uh, uh, attention from everyone in the industry actually. Uh, of how everyone interprets the specification when it comes to the implementation. Yeah, that's why uh, it seems that the English language is harder than uh, advanced mathematics. I guess that's all. Uh, I've got nothing else to share or say. And I hope you enjoyed uh, this talk. It was uh, informative or... Uh, yeah, it was really good. Interesting. <laughs> and for conclusion, as usual, I usually I don't give conclusion. I leave it to the audience to come up with their own conclusion. And that's all for me. And thank you. Well, uh, fa thanks for you and your uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. So, in the paper or anything like, uh, do you have like a set of grammar, sort of like a compilation of your conclusion from uh, all those like, like signatures that you identified from packets you know like uh, I, 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 like i don't know, like signature for like pcaps or like all those things did you uh did you manage to compile everything as like a as like a tool or some like signature format i'm not sure what people use for like network like uh, detection uh, was the like the, was the equivalent of the rr rules you know uh, hey. but i would assume there is an equivalent exactly i, I actually uh in the paper I do have I mean, all of these uh, packet captures and I have a conclusion and I do mention the uh, 95 hashes of all of the malware that I talked about. However, I do not share the PCAPs nor any tool publicly. Okay. Uh, why? I mean, the uh, the standard tool in the industry, like the open source tool is Snort uh, for natural detection. Like you, could, they, you can write your own Snort signature for detecting such anomalies. It's very easy. However, the reason why I didn't publish anything publicly is uh, Snort is the standard one, but there are lots of other commercial vendors that have their own uh, language different from Snort. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I leave it to everyone's uh, understanding to come up with their own sort of rules and implement it in their own devices. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I didn't realize that there were like so many different uh, formats. Uh, yeah. And uh, we got a question from the chat, which was asking, uh, do common proxy or URL, uh, URL filters protect against such exfiltration? I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, do like common proxy or URL filters protect against such exfiltrations? Oh, well, if the proxy is 100% adhering, to the RC specification, then uh, it might reject such request. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on the implementation that the proxy uh, has. 
yeah it may reject some stuff and may let some other stuff to pass uh basically right exactly i mean and also uh you can i mean we all know that proxy is a, is a very important tool like for filtering HTTP traffic and uh, you can easily write signature that would check for some of these anomalies but it really depends on the order of evaluation when it comes to the proxy receiving a request and uh, parsing it so i and i believe it is a proxy vendor specific like when it comes to evaluating these uh, things so i can generalize my answer okay okay um yeah uh i think that's it i already put your slides and the white paper you sent me on, on github actually I was just showing it on the screen now uh okay. for the audience uh awesome. i don't think we have more uh questions so any last words to uh to conclude uh, that's all i will also be like publishing on my uh, website like the uh the slides and the paper and uh other, other than that well thanks again for the uh opportunity to present our code and uh, i hope everyone enjoyed it and uh, learned something from it that's all yeah yeah definitely yeah, thanks again for coming oh, <laughs> take thank care <laughs> bye. thanks bye, bye.